So getting back to the World of the Gare book by the um, by Chaim Korfin and David Katz. I don't know what's so controversial about Rabbi Korfin. I guess it's something that I don't know. Somebody brought up once something he was controversial. I don't know. I never heard of this before. But anyway, he makes some amazing points here, really interesting things that he continues to talk about that are just very relevant to B'nai Noach experiences. I'm here on page 79 of the book. And so again, he's talking about the story of Naaman and Elisha and how Naaman comes to Elisha. So just to, to review a little bit, actually, let's start from the bottom of page 78 to so get back into it. He says, Naaman travels with a large retinue to Elisha, and he is treated shabbily. He's not treated as he would expect to be treated, as the joint chiefs of staff of King, you know, the king of uh, uh, Aram there, Armenia, Arme Ar Armenian king, he expects to be treated appropriately, you know, greeted with you know, whole entourage and meeting the prophet himself and being maybe brought gifts. Who knows? I don't know. Instead, what happens? So Elisha does not even come out to greet him, but sends a servant who tells Naaman to go and dunk in the Jordan River seven times. Seven. Another number. So he gets off on a tangent, but the, but the, the point really is this first three lines are extremely important. He's disappointed, but the way he's treated from the beginning you know, he's, he's coming to meet the representative of Judaism, you know, representative of God, and he's, mistreated, what he, he's mistreated. At least he, his perception is that he's mistreated, right? And then he's given instructions to dunk in the Jordan River seven times. Another disappointment, because it, so not only is the way he is received insulting, but what he's taught is what he's told to do is laughable. He doesn't understand what he's told to do. He was told to, you know, take volcanic, you know, ash and throw it on himself, cut himself up, you know, bathe in the blood of goats. I don't know. Some crit. Listen, you know, think about pagan cultures. What is he told to do? He's told to just dunk in the river seven times. I mean. I'm sure people were swimming in that river every day. They were taking baths in the river. Nothing ever happened. He doesn't understand what, what you know, immersing in the river, or dunking, as he said, seven times is going to make any difference. It's not that it's, it's nothing magical about it. It's, in other words, it's unlike the typical magical, you know, type of medicines, I guess, or rituals that he's been a part of. You know, it's just very... It doesn't seem unique. It doesn't seem like it's something that could really do anything, you know? So he's disappointed about how he's treated, and then he's also disappointed in his instruction. He's very doubtful about his instruction. He's very suspect that it won't help. He's full of doubts. Not only full of doubts, I think originally he refuses to do so. He laughs at it. Um, and then in a side note here on page 79, he talks about the importance of the number seven. It actually is a very special number. It's not just a, you know, a, a nothing number. Seven days of the week, the seven colors of the rainbow, seven shepherds, meaning to say the seven leaders of Israel. And the most significant of all, the seven laws of Noah. So seven is a special, unique number. In fact, in the Midrash, it says that all sevens are beloved so number seven is something very special and unique. And the yellow hand has been raised. Ross? Yes, sir. One of the uh, aspects to it, to part of, part of what uh, they say that Nauman was probably upset about is, if you've ever seen the Jordan River in comparison to the Tigris or the Euphrates, the Jordan River looks like some little creek. <laughs> You know, not really much of a, uh, a river. And I think it was yeah. uh, Mark Twain that said, 
that the river bends and twists so many times that he said, if you walk in a straight line, you'll never know which side of the river you're on. Wait a minute. Did you read ahead? Oh, no, I thought I was quoting that from memory. It could be, but it happens to be on the following page, I think. My so, man. That's okay. We're going to get to that. I'll it's, it's all, all accurate. All accurate. So, so the point is, think about what we've just said. And you realize that, I mean, just in my little bit of experience with Nativ, I've come across people who've had these experiences. Meaning to say people who have either have had a disappointing experience with a rabbi or a Jewish community, you know, or maybe there's certain instructions, laws in Judaism that they that confuse them, that they that they can't understand, that intuitively doesn't seem right to them. And um, and so he's going to, you know, in the next paragraph, he's going to talk about this, how. Naman's reaction and what happens to him is again a paradigm. It's a very it's, it's part of what he says the program. It's very it's a typical or it's actually actually part of the process of what a gear of Benoah has to go through. So let's see the next paragraph. Alicia has humbled a great Armenian general, taking him down hard from his inflated ego. God says there is room inside this man for only one of us, either him or me. So that's an expression the sages say that's not just about Naaman, that's just about everyone. That, uh, that a, a, a person who's full of hubris and arrogance, um, there's no room for both that man and, and God in, in, that, in that place. So in other words, that an arrogant push, person pushes God away from that place and for, from his being. The humiliation at the hands of the prophet is a part of the program. So it's a deflate his ego. It's an important part of becoming the gear. The everyman gear might call a rabbi who has no time for him, or he might actually show up at a synagogue to pray along with the Jewish people and be ignored or snubbed by the congregation. See, so it's part of the typical occurrence. Or worse, they might suspect him of being a missionary and ask him to leave. <coughs> God loves to test the gear. Every test is drawing him closer with cords of love. As it says, your rod and, and your staff comfort me. So in other words, what is the rod? The rod represents harsh discipline. The teacher hitting the, the student with the stick. So that's what, that's what King David is saying there in Psalm 23, that the rod and the, the, the rebuke and the dis, being disciplined by God comforts him. So... Yeah, it's that's a level, but it's what we have to we have to really really think about hard and, and make sure that we understand it. It doesn't necessarily make it easy. I've spoken about this many times when we go through different struggles and suffering. It doesn't mean it's not gonna hurt, but if we know this in our mind, at least we we can at least explain it to ourselves about what's going on and try to keep things in perspective. Okay. I mean, the way he's saying it is so helpful um, because he's saying it's part of the program. It's to be expected. You know, it's, 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 it's like the pre-op to the surgery or to get into that sorority or what is it called? And you have to go through, I don't know, to get into a certain club, you have to go through a certain test. Um, Lahavdil, but... So we're saying these things that the person has to go through to get to where they want to get. And, and when you know that, it makes it easier. You're, you're, you're prepared. You, it's part of your expectation. Next paragraph. This is the real reason that Elisha does not even speak directly to him. The prophet wants the healing to be between <clears throat> Naaman and God himself. If Elisha were to place his hands on Naaman and heal him directly, there might be room for error. Naaman might presume that the prophet himself performed the miracle. The true prophet of God is concerned only for the glory of God. The true prophet flees from fame and honor. Elisha wants this Gentile to come to his father in heaven, not to himself. He wants Naaman to reject idolatry. And so to make sure there's no mistake, he, doesn't want to, he won't perform the healing through his own body's hands, etc., 
Okay. So it's just another thing, you know, another reason why he doesn't appear to Naaman is so that there's not that direct connection and Naaman doesn't see as a healing coming from the prophet, but he, he sees it coming from God. Next paragraph. How amazing it is that the Jewish people never made a God out of Elijah the prophet, Elisha's master. The only man in scripture to have ascended to heaven in the flesh without dying or Moses. Think about it. No one ever worshipped Moses. How is that possible? The man who split the Red Sea and did not eat or drink for 40 days on Mount Sinai. Yet, his people never worshipped him or made him into an avatar. The true prophet of Israel does not take the glory of God for himself. And so, Elisha communicates with Naaman through a messenger until the miraculous healing is completed so that Naaman will know that it is God who heals him and not Elisha. That's an interesting point, too, in that the disappointments we have with people, sometimes even God's representatives. And we may wonder, why is this happening to me? And, and we may feel like rejecting the whole system. But it could be that it's exactly providence to make us less dependent on human beings and make sure that we realize that the place to be dependent on is that faith in is God himself, not in people. So those disappointments may be a, a divine teaching to us, even though it's a tough one and a hard one, maybe a bitter pill sometimes, but it's to make us less dependent on human beings and more dependent on God. I actually saw in, in, in a, I have a book of, uh, was given to me by a friend actually, of um, stories of the Baal Shem Tov, you know, the, uh, the uh, founder of the Hasidic movement, one of the things he says there is um, that um, there's a verse in Psalms that talks about how we actually studied it. It's one of the first ones where it says, uh, God says to David, or David talks about, it, quotes God, so to speak, as saying to David, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And the Balshanta was an orphan. And he, the book says that he said to himself as a child that this resonated with him. And he felt that this verse was telling him, was speaking to him, and that he was God's son, that he, was in, that, that he lost his physical flesh, fleshy father, so to speak. But his father in heaven, God, you know, was his true father. So when we have disappointments with rabbis or people in congregations or even at Nativ, it should never happen. But uh, um, you should realize that it may just be a test. It may just be a way of making us realize that, yes, people have faults, people make mistakes, and that one we can always rely on is the Almighty. So, okay. Paragraph. Any questions up to here or comments the, for anyone who hasn't raised their hand so far? Okay. Bottom uh, paragraph at the bottom of 79. But the everyman Gare is angry about the way Elisha ministered to him. He had risked traveling into enemy territory and was humiliated for his troubles. No one ever treated this powerful general and confidant of the king in such a manner. All of Naaman's preconceived notions of what could or should happen are dashed to pieces. You see something again, preconceived notions and expectations were dashed, very typical. He has now entered the next phase of the Geir program. He sees the Jew and Jewishness as in a negative light. After all, even God himself called them a stiff necked people. And what about the Jordan, that miraculous Jewish river? A third rate trickle by world standards. See, that's what you were talking about, Ross. When the American author Mark Twain visited the Holy Land in 1867 and saw the Jordan River, by which he had been reading in the Bible his whole life, he practically fainted. In his own words, quote, when I was a boy, I somehow got the impression that the River Jordan was 4,000 miles long and 35 miles wide. It is only 90 miles long and so crooked, the man does not know which side of it he is on half the time. Mark Twain and in Innocence Abroad, chapter 55. Interesting. Then he goes on to say, next paragraph, page 80, Mark Twain grew up on the banks of the Mississippi River, which at one point is over two miles wide. 
And in Israel, he saw a pathetic little stream that slows to a dribble and practically dries up completely in some places. You call this a river? Naaman wants nothing to do with it. He is ready to abort the mission. But God will not let go of him. No one can save a person out of the hand of God, not even the person himself, not even a Jewish prophet. This is all about God working with the gear. And that's a very interesting ending to the paragraph. We understand that in many ways, um, the Jewish people, uh, the land of Israel may not be as impressive as people imagine it to be, you know, imagine them to be. Um, I mean, we, I think I've, I've brought this up many times. I mean, the, uh, the nations have tremendous natural resources and um, so many natural wonders on, on their land all over the world. Every time I open up my computer, um, on, on the, uh, right on the, what do they call it? Right on the uh, desktop page, I guess. I don't know what it's called. The wallpaper, they show me some new image of some amazing natural uh, wonder, you know, some amazing waterfall or river or ocean or all over the world. There's just so many amazing places and, and beautiful, you know, majestic scenes, waterfalls and mountains and rivers and bays, you know, islands and Plains, I mean, you know, the whole deal, just like we have in this country. What an amazing country, the United States, so full of natural resources. It's got everything here. So, I mean, it isn't really surprising that Mark Twain was a little disappointed. Um, <laughs> so similarly, people may come to a synagogue and it may not, you know, look as, impress as, as, impress as impressive as some fancy church. Or, you know, the rabbi may not look as impressive as some guy in long robes. I don't know. But uh, again, that's part of what, what this person has to go through to kind of um, strip themselves of these superficial things and look, look at things a little bit deeper. But the end of the paragraph is, is more troubling or a little bit harder to understand because he seems to be implying that the gear is not working out of choice, but it's fate. And that's a little bit harder to understand and, and you know, kind of questionable. I mean, doesn't that just throw up everything into the air? First of all, don't take credit away from my B'nai Noach community, excuse me. What is every, everyone is just, um, you know, uh, you, everyone has like a chosen mark on them and that's it, like it's destined and finished. Um, you know, that's clearly not the case. So, but yet he's saying that God won't leave Naaman alone. And so he won't leave the gear alone. What do you think he means by this? He can't mean he mean that it's just some type of absolute fate, you know, destiny. As we were, it's funny, actually, this is connected to something we were talking about, because I don't know, you probably maybe remember from school, they used to call it about the United States manifest destiny that the whole continent would be joined, right? So point is, is this destiny that the gear that can't be stopped, that a person who has this inside them to be a Ben Noach will reach it? Is that what he's saying? Or is it just, a, or is it just maybe a degree of magnetism? The person's pulled, but in the end, it is their choice. I mean, from a rational side, I think that's more reconcilable than to say that it's an absolute, because if it's an absolute, then, well, where's human choice? And it doesn't, doesn't really make sense. But what, any comments, any thoughts about this? Was it, all, was it meant to be? Did you have to be in the place you are now, everyone? Is this a place that, would, you know, it couldn't have happened any other way? What do you think? about your own situations. I'll go. Sure. Everybody's journey is unique. And I was, if we're headed towards God, I mean, it's unlimited as to how we get there because you can talk to a hundred people and get a hundred different uh, stories as to 
what their experience has been. But it, it's kind of, I, I can understand what he's saying is this, uh, if you have this desire, inclination, or whatever that draws you towards God, if you move in that direction, he will give you every assistance to continue. So it's an, it's an assistance we're talking about. So when he says in the paragraph, but God will not let go of him. No one can save a person out of the hand of God, not even the person himself. Not, that's pretty strong language. So, Sandy? Well, it makes me think uh, about the part, part, Parshas we're reading right now about Moses. He wouldn't let Moses go. Uh, no matter how many objections Moses put before him, he was, he was not going to let him go. So I don't know. Yeah, but in the end, Moses did agree. I mean, he finally caved in. Well, same as Naaman, eventually. He, he agreed, too. Right, yeah. right. I mean, I have more of a problem with war difficulty with the author's language than the story. I understand Naaman finally agreed, but the way the author, you know, Robert Chlorophene and Katz are, are describing this, it's kind of like no one can stop it because God wants it to happen. And, you know, that's just a complicated, it just, again, it's just such a complicated topic. Um, but um, it's not the way from a human perspective we generally look at things. I mean, there are occasions where a person may, there may be an event that's so predestined cosmically that it has to happen. I mean, I think they've said about Judah and Tamar, that's not something that had to happen. But I mean, generally speaking, a person has choice. They may be pulled in a certain direction, but I mean, they have to make the final decision. And it's hard to, I think that's the same thing in Nalman and the same thing with every year. I think it's, um, I think it's shortchanging a person to take away the value of the choices that they've made and the sacrifices people have made and the difficult changes people have made and just say, you know, God's making this happen. It just had to happen. I know. I think that's a, that's not a Jewish way of looking at life. I think it's a very. I think it's one of the elements about the idea of Messiah in in Gentile culture is an idea of a person who's just chosen and destined to save and was just chosen with the power from birth, and he just is. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I see it, that people are waiting for some savior, some Superman to appear. When really it's not the case that this Messiah, he, it's true he's, he's born with tremendous ability, but he's even put through even more tremendous tests. From what I understand, and we spoke about Messiah, I think, during the Q&A this past Sunday, but so I guess I'm, I'm feeding off or, or propelling off that conversation. But uh, the Messiah goes to very difficult tests, according to what I studied and heard from teachers. And, you know, it, so some of the most difficult people a person can imagine in his own personal life, before he reaches the point of being a leader and being a savior and so on. So, so it's not as people imagine, but that, that is what people want to believe. People want to believe that they can't, but someone will be born one day who just, who's just got it. And, you, get, you know, but, and, you know, because there is a point to both. It, it is true that, that we, not everyone can be, you know, can be the, the, the well, the, the, the famous luminaries and gifts to mankind. I mean, let's just, let's leave religion aside for a moment. Not anyone can be a, uh, um, a Mozart, right? I mean, just not everybody can be a Mozart or a Beethoven. These, they did have tremendous gifts, you know? So I think, I think uh, they say Mozart more than Beethoven, but uh, Beethoven worked very hard, I think. I, I don't know. I'm not an expert on the subject, but um, so yes, Dennis. Um, excuse me. Um, 
the breast levers teach about Imuna being trust that Hashem, everything that Hashem is in his control. There's nothing that's not in Hashem's control. Yeah, but you know another thing they teach? But, but what, what, we don't want to become fatalist either, but I mean, uh, if it's in his control, if everything is in his control, then that what they're saying is sort of right. You, you may have choice, but Hashem is moving uh, this chessboard around in such a way, and you're being guided every step of the way. You may think that you're making all the great decisions in the world, but you're really doing what Hashem wants you to do. Uh, that's what they teach, and that's what I've read and studied and everything, and I think that maybe that what there's I, I, look, I don't agree with a lot of what the book you're reading, but I think that the point that they're making is, is that Hashem is in control. We may think that we have free will and we're going to just do whatever willy nilly what we want, but Hashem is moving people, the whole universe around in such a way is that it does accomplish his, his will. Let me ask you a question, Dennis. So in Breslov, they teach that, as you said, that um, you have to have faith that Hashem is in control of everything, correct? Uh, well, Imuna doesn't so, just so mean So let me faith. ask you this question. It means, um, wait a minute. Imuna does not mean just faith. It means trust. Okay. So I trust in Hashem that everything that happens in my life happens for a purpose, whether to train me, to chastise me, to guide me, teach me. Of course. Okay. But the well, question that's... is that element, but, but there's a whole book there is discussing that a person has to, what is it, has to have that trust. So that, so that means that they're saying implicitly that you have to make the decision to have that trust. I mean, otherwise, it's a big circle. I mean, God controls oh, because everything. Hashem has How are you me telling to a me position. to have trust, and then <clears throat> that trust is coming from God? So then what can I do? I can't do anything. But that's not I, what they're teaching. I don't want to do anything that. because anything I would do is going to be messed up. So Every, Everything so, in my life I've ever tried to do by myself has been another failure. And if you don't have trust in Hashem to guide you, then you've got nothing. So the distinction is between results and decisions. You know, yeah. the, the, the results on whether we succeed and even whether we succeed in that our decision is, um, you know, we're able to control ourselves in that decision, whether that decision succeeds. In other words, if I make a decision to have trust, but whether I actually do have trust or not, in, in a certain sense that itself is a gift of God, but I have to want the one thing has to come from me I and think the determination. Just... Wait, can you just let me finish, please? Yeah, I will. The, the, the determination has to come from me, you know, and then I guess God can give me more determination. So it's a highly, highly complex, but the, the point is really is that we have to believe in our own power from God and that it is in our hands. Like Maimonides says, to make the choices, particularly between, you know, good choices and bad choices, and that that's for us to do. Now, will we be able to control our evil inclination, or will it overpower us? You know, that's that's from God. Um, will we succeed in all other areas of life? I mean, look, the famous statement of the sages is that everything is the hands of heaven except fear of heaven. So, in other words, whether we succeed in business, health, and all these, everything is is in the hands of heaven. But even there, if I don't take care of my health, then I'm going to probably won't, I probably won't be healthy. Now, does that determine how long I live? We all know anecdotally that no, it doesn't. Some people are very careful with their health and with some unknown reason that no one knew about, they end up unfortunately having a heart attack. I mean, it does happen sometimes, but generally speaking, if a person is careful with their health, then, then usually their health is better. If a person doesn't pay attention to their health or is, eats very poorly, it's going to have a bad effect. So 
the reason I bring that up is because the confusion there also is that generally there's that statement to the sages I just mentioned that when a person that that when it comes to spiritual things and fear of heaven, a person makes the choice that God opens a space there and lets us make the decision and other things not. And yet we see in life that we do make a lot of decisions. Yes. I think that one point that you're making is, is absolutely correct. I mean, I'm not di disagreeing with you at all, but it comes down to understanding. It's not a matter of me having free choice. It's a matter of me understanding. See, when, when a person understands that Hashem is in control, then he's aware of everything that occurs in his life. If I go outside to take the trash out and stumble and fall, I, first thing that's going to go through my mind is, is, Hashem, what are you trying to tell me here? I'm constantly looking back and saying, what am I supposed to learn from this? So it's understanding. That's the, that's the, is the, the essence of, I guess you could say free will. It's, it is complicated. I understand, but Breslev, if you read all the stuff that they've taught, and I'm not saying that everything is right or wrong. I'm just saying that if we understand that Hashem is in control, then we are aware of our surroundings and we're more cognizant of when we do something, is this his will? This happened to me for a reason. Why? I got sick. Why? Is Hashem telling me to slow down? Is he, what's he trying to tell me? Is, is, am, I, am I wrong? No, no, you're not wrong. I'm just trying to point out that <laughs> even in the Breslov approach, that everything is in the hands of God, but they also say, in, the, Rabbi Nachman says, you know, in many in places, particularly in his book on advice um, that I've studied with a friend, you know, he speaks many times about the tremendous effort a person has to put into his prayers, in his service of God, and everything. So, on the one hand, it's all God. On the other hand, it's all effort. So it's both. In other yeah, words, your yeah. effort is going to yeah. It'll be fruitless if you don't if you don't trust in God and pray to him. He also says that you need prayer for everything. Because as, at the end of the day, if you're to succeed, which is basically the fruits of your labor, you need God's assistance. But at the same time, God wants us to put in 100, 110%. He wants us to put in as much effort as we can, you know, into particularly our holy and spiritual pursuits. I mean, that's the breast of approach that I read. So that's what I wanted to point out to you that, yeah. that it's, you know, at the same time. And I think that, that, that that's empowering to a person also um, because, um, in other words, that, that is the power Hashem is giving us is the power to decide, the power to, of determination. Um, and then he helps us along with, with that. Uh, so I think that, I don't know, I think that's empowering because if a person, for example, for some reason, um, finds that, um, you know, he's not praying well. A person could otherwise think, oh, what's the sign? Well, God just doesn't, that's not my gift. God hasn't given it to me, closed book, see you later, it's over. You know, and the message is no, that keep working at it. Keep working at it and you, and you can open up gates, and you can open up many doors you may have to work, he even says you may have to work, you know, uh, who knows, a year is a lifetime. There's no guarantees it's going to work right away. So um, anyway, I just wanted to point that out because I yeah. think it's, it's central to Judaism that our choices and determination in doing what's right, particularly in ethical and spiritual things, is just so important. Okay. <clears throat> But on the other hand, where do we get the determination from? You know, so it's just this continual circle. How do we get all that determination? We could maybe try, a thought can come to our mind, but where do we get the energy? Where does it get, where is it, how does that turn into a powerful passion? I mean, that, that comes, I mean, all the, why does it enter our mind to, to be more determined? You know, 
God gives us the ability to do all that. So it's a very complex system of, you know, God helping in us and, and, and you know, making a choice within the power God gives us to make the choice. Do you, you agree, Dennis? <laughs> yes, I do agree. Uh, <laughs> I, I, yes, I do agree. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. It's important right, though. The study, studying Torah, being occupied with Hashem is does give you motivation. Right. So right. Uh, it's one of the key elements. Right. I mean, if you're showing that you're interested and you're you're filling your mind with the concepts and the ideas because you want to learn, you want to do better. So that gives you tremendous, tremendous power. Yeah. Tremendous energy and ability to, to move forward. Um, all right, next paragraph. Naman has come to that phase of his life where every occurrence, positive or negative, inspiring or demeaning, is a revelation of God. It's very similar to what you were saying, Dennis. At the very moment that he wants to give up, Naman's servants come to him and say, your attitude is wrong. What have you got to lose? If the prophet has told you to climb the highest mountain or fast for four days to be healed of leprosy, wouldn't you do it? And yet, all he did was tell you to dip in the Jordan River seven times. Simple. Piece of cake. So they tell him, do it. What do you have to lose? I don't know if they use the language of piece of cake, but you get the idea. The point is they told him that it's very easy. It's simple. Okay. An Armenian general's sermon talking to him like this is inconceivable. Chutzpah. They dare treat him like a fool or a child. He could have them killed for insubordination, but no. Naaman has become a vessel for the light, and he hears the truth. Maybe there is a reason that the Jordan is a little river. Did God not appear to Moses in a lowly bush? Was not Mount Sinai a humble little mountain? Maybe its smallness is what endears the Jordan to God. It's an interesting way of ending the paragraphs. In other words, the idea of Naaman dipping in the Jordan, and a lot of the message that God is trying to give to him, and that Elisha is trying to give, is a message of humility. So he's dipping in the Jordan, which is a symbol of humility and being insulted in order to bring himself to humility. So evidently, humility is one of our main lessons here for Naaman. Page 81. So Naaman obeys the words of the prophet. He immerses himself in the Jordan precisely seven times and he is healed. His incurable leprosy is gone. His flesh has become pure and wholesome, like that of a young boy. God has performed a miracle for him. God has chosen Naaman, and now he has openly revealed to Naaman that he has chosen him. So, so evidently, the, the healing is, is a sign of, of being chosen. Well, whatever it is, it's, it certainly is a life changer. And it's, I mean, it's a euphoric moment to be healed of a, of a sickness that, that they, they didn't have any cure for. It was a horrible sickness. Uh, that leached to a person's skin and, and you know, it was, uh, uh, people were isolated from others due to leprosy. It was a horrible condition. And here he was uh, healed from it completely and his skin returned to the health of a baby. So that's, uh, that's the kind of a trick that a lot of movie stars would like to find out how they can get a hold of this potion. But in any event, the point is, is that, uh, I mean, I just can imagine it as being a, a moment of, uh, you know, incredible excitement and euphoria and, and almost like a splitting of the sea in a certain sense, his own personal, yeah, his own personal miracle being saved from something that yeah, he probably never thought would happen. Okay, so at some point in the program, every gear sees that God has chosen, as it says, and I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and bring you to Zion. And will give you shepherds according to my heart, and they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. What an amazing verse. And it clearly does seem to allude to B'nai Noah that because we'll take one from a city and one from a family, and we'll give you two shepherds. What shepherds? The leaders, right? Teachers? It's a shepherd. So it's, at least that's the way it's referred to in the Zohar and other places that the leaders of Israel are called shepherds. And they'll feed you with knowledge and understanding. Finally, we have a miracle that cannot be denied or confused with coincidence. 
It is a life-changing event. That's what I'm saying. This was a life-changing event for Naaman. Naaman and his attendants return to the house of Elisha, who this time comes out to greet him. And Naaman says, Behold, now I know that there is no God in the world except with Israel. He has renounced, renounced idolatry. According to an opinion of the Talmud, this alone qualified Naaman to be a ger tosha with the right to reside in the land of Israel and be supported by the Jewish community. The rejection of idolatry is the defining moment in the life of every Noahide ger. So, I mean, he, he experiences something that, let's face it, most, most Noahides will never experience, you know, in this exile, an open miracle, you know, like that. I mean, that's something that he merited to see. And clearly, he also merited it to that to happen to him uh, for, for posterity, uh, for posterity, you know, because um, it was put in the Bible. It's a story that we all study and know. In other words, I'm saying it didn't just happen for him. It happened for the whole world to learn about the story and be inspired by the story. And I, I, I personally find that, you know, the stories we find in the Tanakh, in the Bible, they, they, there's, there's something about them that resonates with us all. And we feel, and this is true, again, mystically, is that there's a spiritual effect of this that, that when we read it, it's present, you know, and it's speaking to us, particularly the Torah portions during that week that they're being read, that they have a direct relevance to the week. But, you know, so this is a story not just for Naaman, as he's saying, it's a story for all of us. And I think he doesn't say this, but uh, but my personal belief and understanding of the text is, like I just said, is that the stories of the Tanakh, just like their prophecies, are not just for those people, but they're for from generation to generation. So... Obviously, in other words, what I'm saying is God didn't just do this to heal Naaman and to give him faith, but it was to strengthen the faith of those come that would come later. And obviously, this story, as he's pointing out, is a story that inspires B'nai Noach and, and people that come from the nations because it's talking about someone in a similar situation. So that means even today when someone reads a story, they become inspired by the miracle, even though they haven't personally experienced the miracle. And that's really the power of the, of the, of the Jewish Bible, that it, it, you, it resonates with you and you feel somehow that almost like it happened to you, almost that you feel touched by the story in a very deep way. Um, and it is incredible that he did make this decision, that he decided to abandon idolatry because, you know, in those days, since they were polytheists, you know, your guy can do a miracle today. My God does a miracle tomorrow. I mean, the fact that this happened didn't have to, it didn't necessitate the decision that Naaman would, would abandon idolatry. That's something that, again, was part of the miracle, maybe, and it was also part of Naaman's choice, because as he said before, it's part of his being chosen, so to speak. In other words, he already had it in his mind. He may have had doubts about idolatry before. There's something that resonated him in this miracle and all the events that took place in meeting the prophet and the miracle that took place with him to that brought his renouncing idolatry. It didn't have to happen that way. I mean, look at Pharaoh. I mean, you have miracles that, that I mean, that way beyond what happened to Naaman and didn't shake him. I mean, God said that it wouldn't, but it, it even before God intervened into the natural and his natural ability to choose, he wouldn't budge for that reason, because he just believed this is, the, you know, the God of the Hebrews, and he waiting, was waiting for his God to come along and to dish out a little bit. So this was really something extremely unique and, ex and exceptional. And I often feel the same way about the splitting of the sea, that, that, the miracle of the splitting of the sea was, was there were many sides of the miracle, but when the verse says that the people saw and they feared God and they believed in God and Moses and his servant, that also was a miracle. It was part of the miracle. I should say it was part of the phenomenon. It's not a miracle when, when one of the children of the patriarchs believes in God. I wouldn't call it a miracle because that's like a breaking of the order. But what it is is, is, is that we had here something that happened that touched them. In, a, in other words, there was a spiritual illumination that took place 
beyond the physical miracle that occurred at the splitting of the sea. And similarly here, when Naaman emerged, you know, there was, he was also, there was a, a divine revelation that, that appeared to him in a certain sense, is that he had the awakening that he realized that there's a God in the world. It wasn't just that he was healed physically, he was also healed spiritually in a certain sense. So he must have been making a choice that he was looking for this on some level. So there was already that working because God wouldn't have done that for someone who was a denier, who wanted to deny. But at the same time, he was given this gift where he was able to, he was able to see instead of be blind because we can see many miracles in our lives and say coincidence, phenomenon, fluke, you know, and not be shaken. And so it's an, it's an incredible gift to be inspired by seeing something miraculous. And righteous people see miracles in, every, in the everyday. You know, it's like we say in the prayers, and it's just such a powerful and wonderful statement uh, that towards the end of the prayers, uh, we say, uh, and we say that, that we, we um, recognize you and we, we give thanks to you. And one of the things that's mentioned there in the standing prayer towards the end of the one of the third, the first of the third last three blessings is that we say, and, 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 and on, on account of your miracles that, and, account, and on account of your miracles that are with us every single day. And, you're, and on account of your wonders. So in other words, the daily occurrences are also miracles. And if you think of that, that's the case. It's just miracles we're used to. But none of it has to be, and it's all incredible. So, you know, that sunset that happened, you know, a couple hours ago over here, um, that was a miraculous event. So, but we don't see it that way. And so that's the point. A miracle is two things. It's an unusual event. It's generally the um a phenomenon that that breaks with the natural order of things but it's also an event that touches people in a way that says this is me god say is god saying i'm here it, it communicates that to people in a way that they can't ignore it they don't look away and say this is nothing I, whatever who cares and that's what happened with naman Question or comments? Okay. All right, he brings up the famous dispute in the Talmud of whether a Ger Toshav is someone who simply renounces idolatry or accepts all the seven laws upon themselves. So that's an interesting distinction. Um, uh, but there's no dispute about what a, a righteous of the Gentiles is, someone who keeps the seven. The only issue is whether a permit can be granted for a, a non-Jew to live in the land based on just abandonment of idolatry alone. Okay. Bottom uh, paragraph of page 81. Now, how does Naaman attempt to show his appreciation? By giving tzedakah, by giving charity. Naaman has a giving heart, the finest of all human traits. And the midst of giving tzedakah has actually been grafted onto the body of the seven Noah laws. So every man gayer offers Elisha a generous gift, but he promptly turns it down. Naaman pleads with him to take it. But Elisha is adamant and swears by the name of God that he will accept nothing to diminish the purity of what has happened. He doesn't want to accept it because he doesn't want it to appear as if he did it. it came from God and he doesn't want to take it. And I guess also he doesn't want it to imply that he did it based on some type of monetary gain. Continue on page 82. Elisha wants no material reward for his righteousness. Bringing an idol worshiper to true faith in God is itself the greatest reward imaginable. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov taught that bringing a Gentile from idolatry to faith in the God of Israel is the greatest of all spiritual accomplishments. Wow. Elisha needs nothing from Naaman except the knowledge that he has delivered his precious soul to its maker, the Lord of the universe. That's incredible. 
That's incredible. Not a very well-known statement of Rabbi Nachman that he brings out. How important. And um, maybe, uh, well, it gives me a lot more, I'm a lot more inspired about being involved with the B'nai Noach movement. Look how important it is to Hashem that someone from the nations should, should come under the wing of, of Judaism and knowing the God of Israel. All right. Let's just do a quick, let's do a quick uh, halakha from Path of the Righteous Gentile. I wonder if Rabbi Chlorophene knows I'm doing so much of his book. Anyway. He's very Oops. good. He's very good friends with Rod. Yeah. Yeah, I should talk to. Uh, mention should, it to Rod, yeah. Yeah. I should probably have a conversation with him yeah, and let him yeah. know, make him feel good. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. I should, let me, I'm going to try to remember that. Okay. On page 36, um, the paragraph 10, he says, Great is repentance, for it draws a person close to God. And the further one's distance, the closer and more beloved one can become through repentance. Yesterday, he was despicable in front of God. He was disgusting, distant, and an abomination. Today, he is precious, close, and beloved. And that's the quote. So again, we see this incredible point, which, which the Lubavitcher Rebbe also brings up many times. We, we often want to see... What is the positive that's coming out of the negative? And it's also related to something we said before about everything is, is, is through God's providence. And so you have to ask yourself, why does God allow or even sometimes put great pitfalls in front of people to fall low? Why, why would that happen? And what's the purpose of allowing so much rebellion? But the point is actually because they were so far away, the coming close is so much more powerful and so much more precious. So in that sense, a person um, at, a, at a certain point loses their regret. That, to a certain extent, the pain over the past can be cured by realizing that all the things they've done, what well, they turn to merits, right? That, that it, and it's a great sanctification of God, as we just said about the Ben Noah, from someone who's, who's very far to come very close there's no really greater sanctification and glorification of God's name. And it's, a, it's the most precious thing be before him. Um, I don't remember getting to the to actually paragraph nine last time. Uh, last time we did the book, Path of the Righteous Gentiles. So by the way, I'm on page 35 there, returning to God. We were discussing the laws of repentance. And last time we were discussing how others have to choose, have to treat the penitent and how the victim of the penitent's previous abuse has to forgive him. And we had a long conversation about that last time. Um, and my place mark was on page 36, but I don't remember really talking about I, a paragraph nine on page 30, starting on page 35. It says, it is a grave sin to say to a penitent, remember your previous deeds. Or to mention anything of his past ways in order to embarrass him or to mention ideas or incidents that will remind him of what he has done. So here's another obligation on everyone else around the penitent. Not to, to treat him with sensitivity, not to remind him of his past, not to embarrass him, and to let him move on. It's a very, um, also a very, very important point. Uh, and um, part of the distinction between Judaism and some other 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 uh, forms of, of thinking. Um, it was evidently in the 19th century, or maybe uh, the 18th century, certain philosophies that believed that 
and also in the 20th century, that people were born a dredge or they were born, you know, to be rich, born to be a higher human being or a lower human being. And um, I think in, in the, uh, that's part of the element in the, in the Les Miserables story is, is this concept that whether there's such a thing as redemption of a person or not. And so that stems from Judaism, the idea that the prisoner can be redeemed and not be, be looked at as a criminal or because he committed a crime, he's forever a criminal and he should be condemned for life, even if he gets out, but everyone continues to, um, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, be disgusted with him and reject him. And that's part of that story, whether a person is forgiven whether they can be redeemed or what they do is, is, is condemns them forever. So, so clearly Judaism is the other way around. Not only that, but puts a, 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 an obligation on the rest of the community not to remind him and to embrace the person. But of course, that's assuming the person did actually repent. Okay, question or comments? We're kind of ready to wrap up.